So without further ado, yeah, I want to introduce our featured guest for today, Russell Brand. He is the current Chief Curriculum Officer of a company called Brain Sprays, which is a voice application for uh, school-aged children to learn a lot of like K through 12 math and vocabulary curriculum through Alexa lessons. Uh, Russell's also the founder and current managing director of Responsible Solutions, where for more than 25 years now, he's consulted across sectors, including IT, security, and applied sciences for large projects and data management. Uh, Russell, thanks so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you for giving me a chance to be here. As I often say, Founder Institute is the high point of my day, pretty much every day of my life. Well, we're so glad to yeah, have you as our, as our guest. I know you've been networking with founders at previous ones, like in the, in the lounge, previous versions of this event. So yeah, we're happy to have you here and, and teach us a little bit today about pitching to angel group. Uh, it, is my, it is deeply my pleasure. Um, awesome. Well, I'm going to yeah. hide myself while you talk, and then as soon as you wrap up your presentation, I'll, I'll bring myself back on and we'll kind of move to that AMA question. But again, don't hold back. If you have questions while Russell's presenting, just put them into the chat, and that way um, we will uh, uh, start queuing them up, you know, for, for right when we start to the question portion. All right. All right. And, one of the, and I will perhaps learn to use a computer. Maybe even today will be that day. Will be that day. <laughs> I know you got it. So thank you all. I'm Russell Brand. I'm going to talk about pitching to angel groups today. I'd like to encourage everyone to make their questions as specific as possible. At the point you're going to ask general questions, while well, you can get general answers reading blogs, the more you talk about your specific situation, the more useful a set of answers that we can, get, that we can give you. All right. So the first question is whether you're ready to pitch to an angel group. Five things that you're looking to think about. One is what you have in terms of traction or in terms of proof of product market fit. I am finding very often that people are either trying to go to an angel group where they have no, nothing to tell an angel to make them believe that anyone wants a product. Half of all companies fail because they build something nothing wants. My new saying for the week is slide eight is the new slide two. As the last 20 talks I've reviewed have had their product market fit, traction grants, all of that on slide eight, where it was the most interesting thing and deserved to be on to slide two. Second is team. While there is no statistical difference in success rate between solo founders and, and founder groups up to size six, there is a giant reluctance to fund solo founders and almost perfect reluctance to fund, to fund an individual that doesn't have a team of at least three. Third is exit strategy. If you don't have a plan to be acquired, you probably aren't fundable by an angel. If you're just going to make money and making money is good, then angels aren't where you're going to go to get money. And if you believe you're going to IPO, you're probably wrong since most successful exits are acquisitions. You want to know that that money is going to give you real leverage. And that leverage means that at the end of spending that money, you've accomplished something so the next round will be at a better valuation. Saying I'll spend 70% of the money on this and 30% on that and 40% on that in addition to being more than 100%. If you don't have a clear explanation of how the company is more valuable after you spent the money, you're not ready to pitch. Most importantly, Pitching takes a lot of time and doesn't, doesn't otherwise advance your company. There is often, almost always, but not always, a better way to get money, especially if you're not a hyper-growth function-focused company. So think about other alternatives before you spend what is likely to be the better part of a thousand person hours doing your pitching and investor management. 
every minute you spend talking to angels is a minute you're not spending cust you're not spending doing something else primarily customer development sometimes product development your best chance of success as a company is to get customers to fund your work rather than angels they don't take us to equity they don't take as much time they keep you on track most angels like most human beings are kind so they they don't say no they say come back to me later or this sounds interesting and so you can waste lots and lots of polite time on things that will not lead you to getting money from them almost anything other than a yes leaving aside very particular plans should be taken as a no. There are plans known as the Whaley method where you're gonna say, I'm looking a year before I'm gonna get funding to be talking to particular groups every month or two and showing them progress and building relationships. But if you're trying to get money in the next three months, anything which isn't a yes, any maybes or no's. There are a lot of non-angels pretending to be angels, especially at pitch events. I was at a pitch event before COVID, and out of 100 people in the room, I was the only investor. The other 99 people were people looking to sell professional services, and I don't think a single one of them was, a, was an accredited investor. I divide pitching into three stages. And I do this because they're very different things, and blurring these stages together makes the talk ineffective. The first thing is, how do you get past no? The second is, how do you get them to tell me more? And then the third is getting a conditional yes. They bring me into due diligence. The no's are, how do you get them through the first 45 seconds of your video? How do you get through the assistance? And... I was at a talk yesterday where the talk for the first minute and 20 seconds was entirely wasted. The remaining minute was wonderful. Every sentence in that last minute would have interested an investor. And in real life, no investor would have listened long enough to hear any of those useful sentences. Avoiding no is about front loading. Slide decks tend to become very, very long, and you'll never get through them in three minutes or five minutes or 15 minutes. So everything that seems to be useful but isn't directly part of these three things becomes a backup slide so that when they ask a question, you can say, I'm glad you asked that, and put the slide up. The most common things they're going to be asking for is more on market analysis, more on competitive landscape, sometimes on financials, but usually not in a, a first in a first meeting. Market size, big one. Lots of people get uh, die a horrible death when the investor in the audience Googles finds five competitors and you've heard of none of them. So Getting past no, this is not a product pitch. You are not trying to get someone to buy your widget. I've seen wonderful product pitches where I say, yeah, I want one of those. Not going to invest in the company, but sure, I'll buy one. Doesn't do us any good. The people in your audience are going to be a wide range of people, from people who know more about the field than you are to people who have never heard of your field. So your explanation has to be simple but has to not take shortcuts that will offend experts. Since most companies fail because they build things no one wants, we'd like to believe you've had discussions with many customers. Ideally, you wanna say there are customers actively looking for a solution. Those are the early adopters that are easy to get. The everyone has this problem, but no one knows it, costs a zillion dollars of marketing budget, PR budget, education budget, you can't do it. You have to show that you have industry knowledge. If you, and if you don't have either lots of discussion with customers or 20 years of industry in the field, at least third party reports that show it's a real problem people are trying to solve. You need to know that there are enough of the people 
who care enough about it to buy it? Is your market at least $100 million? If your market isn't $100 million, it's probably too small for an angel investor. We'd like to see some sort of traction. Often that is waiting lists or at least subscription to newsletters. LOIs, letters of intent, are better than, than just waiting lists. Waiting list with a down payment, um, actual trials running. But some, I got to have some reason to believe that people care enough about it, they're going to buy it now rather than it's always next year's project. There are always alternatives. Lots of things you don't think about as alternatives. You need to be able to know what they're doing now. And it's really hard to be better than nothing. Adoption is a pain in the butt. Adoption is risks. You need a good answer to, are you really better than nothing? Unless you are doing something entirely new, which is unlikely, there are other people who have tried this before and failed and lost investors lots of money. You need to know who they are, why they failed, and why you won't. Last week, I looked at a company and said, I love the idea. I've lost company money in seven companies that have failed at this. Why will I not lose money with you guys, too? They didn't know about any of the companies that had failed. Didn't inspire confidence. Didn't get a second meeting. The best way to get acquired is to be acquired before you scale. Big companies are better at scaling than you are. Doing scaling generally makes your life miserable. So look at who has a history of acquiring companies before they scale. If they haven't acquired before, you're unlikely to be the first and why they will acquire you. A good explanation of who will acquire you before you scale is rare. It will set you apart from other companies. You need to be able to explain how it is that you will get customers and you want specifics, not just, I will use influencer marketing and buy ads. Who are your influencers? Where will you buy ads? Who are the decision makers? The vagueness on this is a reason to not believe in you. Not understanding the adoption process or the is a reason to not believe in you. You got to actually make money somehow. Is that licensing? Is that subscriptions? Are you selling physical objects? Is it advertising? 10 or 15 years ago, you could say, we'll have a huge community and we'll figure out how to monetize it later. That doesn't play very well anymore. You, you, you need something profitable. You can't lose money on every unit, make it up on volume. What are your unit economics? You need a team who's working, who's working full-time. Advisors aren't staff members, right? One of you and a million advisors isn't good enough. We'd like to have at least three of you that are working close to full time. We want to know who it is you'll hire when you have the money, whether they're part time or advising or not there yet. We don't want to hand you money and wait a year while you go and go and do a search for employees. Um, Someone who tells me they've had three successful exits and is looking for $25,000 or something is just wrong. If you are wealthy, you should have a lot of money that you've already put in. If you're rich enough, you should be writing a check rather than talking to these people because you believe and it takes time. On the other hand, if you are young and haven't made a lot of money yet, it's easy to explain why you haven't written a $25,000 check. But if you've had three exits, it, it, it just looks fishy. If you've got skin in the game, even if it's a little bit of money, talk about the cash you put in. It gives you credibility. It shows you have belief. It sets you apart from people with just vague ideas and stars in their eyes. If you make it through here, that's a level of success. You're now to the point where it's people are ready to say, tell me more. We've gone past why you're not going to fail. And this is why you will, su will succeed. Here is more about, yes, we're really going to make it. It's not just there is a problem to solve, but we are the ones to solve it. We have a secret sauce. Use of funds. Nine times out of ten, I see it's salaries in this category and salaries in that. Salaries aren't things. 
Salaries for marketing is part of a marketing budget. Salaries for development is part of a development budget. But I really care about the milestones you'll achieve with that money because those milestones means the next round is at a higher valuation, at least on paper, I'm ahead. When you're going to individual angels, part of what you're giving them is a story to tell, a story to tell at their cocktail parties. And that story, and if you're going onto a crowdfunding platform even more so, is more valuable to them than the money you will make for them later. So think about how in two sentences they will be able to brag to their friends about you for the next five to seven years before we know whether the company has made any money. All right. Here is your next part. If you make it here, you know, congratulations. Most people don't. It's a lot of work and practice to get here. Here's where they're going to be asking you some hard questions. And the answers are going to have to be too brief because you're going to need to sit down. And each of these answers takes five minutes and you have 30 seconds. So you want the short version of each answer and to say, we can, you know, we can get together and talk about the, de and talk about the details. Here is where you want to disclose any surprises, something which is bad and surprising that I know before going into DD, I can talk about and what your countermeasures are. A surprise during due diligence writes you off. I don't know what else is hidden. And it doesn't just write you off to me for this one company. It writes you off to me and my entire community for the rest of your life, perhaps the next five generations. No surprises. So three not so easy steps. Know what step you're in. Get past the no get past the nose. All of the reasons you'll fail. Get people to want to know more because you're saying why you're the ones who will really succeed. Short answers to the hard questions so you can get the individual meeting to give the long answers to the hard questions and advance any potential surprises in those very short answers. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Russell. That was a uh, yeah, super information dense uh, presentation. I feel like that was kind of a, you know, a micro sampling of, uh, you know, an entire like startup cur curricula or like an accelerator program itself. So that was, that was really great. Um, I guess to kind of kick it off, uh, my, my first question is, you know, it, it's always, and this is sort of what you're talking about, the, the sort of gated three different stages. It's always a, a process of like, getting to that next meeting. And I guess my question is sort of, um, it, it's sort of like about the term angel syndicate or like angel groups, you know, is there a difference when you're pitching to like a single angel or a solitary investor about how you think about the next step in that due diligence process? When you're pitching to like a group, is there like some kind of dynamics that happens in the background where uh, that next step in the sequence is, is different in any way or are they, are they like the same? So the larger and better established the group or syndicate, the more serious the due diligence process will be. The checklist we have at Karitsu is literally 493 pages of wow. due diligence checklist. When you talk to an individual, an individual angel, if they've got a checklist at all, it's less than, it's less than 20 questions. So the smaller the group, the more the, the more the the what is the story I can tell my friends matter. The larger the group, the more what it the more what is my exit plan matters. And the bigger the the check size of the group, then the larger that acquisition has to look like. If you're going to a tiny angel syndicate saying, yeah, we're, we're really looking at a $40 million exit is fine. But a large angel group, you've got to be looking at a you know, $200 million exit for them to, to think about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. OK, so first um, audience question I want to ask is from Thomas. And it's, uh, yeah, a little bit related to exit strategy, I guess. But it's really a question about valuation. He says, one of the hardest things to calculate is the true valuation for my startup in the early stage. Uh, and then he asks, what are typical valuations of angel companies you invest in? 
uh, and how do you determine the valuation? Or maybe another way to think about it is like, because you emphasize the exit strategy part, um, you know, is there like a valuation multiple or uh, maybe these are two separate questions I'm trying to blend together. I guess just speak to the valuation um, question that Thomas had. Uh, just how, how do you think about that when you're especially very early stage and it's, um, you know, there's assumptions being made. Okay, so if you're very early stage, um, there are five things to think about the strength of your team, the, pro the progress you've made, the process you have, the, the demonstration of your, of your customers, the size of your market. Figure if you're perfect on all three of those as an early stage company, first round of fun funding, you've got an argument for being worth two to two and a half million dollars. As you are proportionally less perfect for each of those, scale that down. And that is what a sort of fair world is then there are different angel groups that um that have a point of pride in lowballing and they'll lowball because uh, they figure they're going to give you a whole lot of help and maybe they will or not or because they think they have a lot to choose from there are groups at this point who really get caught up in ideas and they will overvalue you which at the moment is good to get you money, but your next round often ends up having to be a down round and that makes it hard to get your, ne your next round. So look at those five characteristics, scale yourself on a zero to a half million dollar basis, add them up and say that's probably fair. Second thing to do is look at what your acquisition is likely to be. And you know, how long is it going to take you to get there? If it's going to be a pre-scaling IPO, you're sort of thinking four years. And you want at least a 30% ROI for the investor to get there. You want at least a factor of 10 to get there. And you, so whatever the lower of those two numbers are is what many of the investors will think about. That would be your second common way to do valuation. Your third is to try to find a company that is somewhat similar that's recently been funded. And there are ecosystems where companies just command a premium because they're part of that, that circle. And so if you're comparing against someone that's come out of Y Combinator, you got to decrease whatever that number is by 20 or 25% to get a comp. If you're in Silicon Valley and you're comparing to someone coming out of Iowa, you can add 15% to, to get a comp. So take those three, they hopefully come up with about the same number. And they generally do. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, our audience is starting to put more questions into the chat. So yeah, great. Uh, please don't be shy. So the second question is from Tomzen uh, asking, I'm currently raising from angels right now, says they're made it to your stage three. Uh, can you talk just quickly about um, convertible note tax? Uh, so yeah, thoughts on convertible notes. They're, they're usually founder friendly, correct? I mean, um, yeah, is that a normal uh, offering or? Convertible notes are the most common form of investment from people my age. People a little younger tend to invest on safes. Given a choice between a safe and a convertible note, you would rather have a safe. The difference is generally not important. The difference becomes important when something goes wrong, goes wrong, goes wrong, in which case the safe protects you much better. When you say cap, whatever the cap is, that is your valuation. If you're dealing with very friendly people, you can often get an, a, a note which is a 20% discount to next rounds with no cap or a most favored nation status, which says the same terms as the next. You can sometimes divide your round into three tranches and give warrants to, to the people at the front of it, especially if it's a convertible note, then the lemmings follow. Um, there are, is almost no one that will invest in an uncapped note unless there are other things going on. Personal relationships, some strategy of an investor you're approaching and so at the point where you say uncapped notes most investors and essentially all professional investors will just tell you to go away mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think the, the, the main clarity point that I, I sort of missed that you emphasized is that the safe is really the, the more uh, founder friendly. So if you can. Right. Yeah, so with the cardinal note, there is a point in time where if you haven't gotten your next round, the investors can shut you down and say, dissolve this thing, distribute the IP. And now they've got this big club and they can, and they can extract concessions. With a safe, they can't do that. There's a company that I'm an early stage investor in and because the details of the convertible note were slightly wrong, we lost fully a year on a $25 million funding round because the early investors had leverage and wanted better special treatment that the new round of investors wouldn't agree to. Had that been a safe, a year sooner, we would have had that money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. They held, um, us, they held us captive on less than $2 million. The, the next question here is from Ankit from Pathloom, uh, who's one of the founders who I met in person before, going back before the COVID time. Uh, hey, nice to see you, Ankit. Uh, he said, uh, what, what's the best way, I mean, to just connect with and engage with uh, angels and angel groups uh, who are outside of your, uh, you know, immediate warm network? Um, are there, you know, it's really just like get out there and you really can't kind of pitch too much, right? I mean, do you have advice for people who are, want to grow their network of the number of investors who are there? interacting with how to, how to get out there and pitch their company? Oh, I'd say pitching is probably your worst of all possible strategies for that. Pitching is generally a waste of time. Pitching is providing entertainment for people going to pitches rather than finding people who want to invest. So first you need Introduc you need introductions or you need a strategy to develop long-term relationships or you need both. If you're going to talk to someone, you want to be able to say, have they made an investment in the la last 18 months or had a liquidity event in the last 18 months? If they haven't done one or the other, the chances of investing are really small. Um, FI is saying six months rather than 18, I will say 18. People and institutions almost always only invest in a particular size round. Sometimes they say check size, but it's really round size. If they haven't invested in a round size of your, of your size, it's a waste of your time. Whatever they say they're investing in, almost everyone invests only in a really narrow range of areas. If they haven't invested in in your area by some reasonable definition, they're unlikely to have the knowledge to start investing in yours. Waste of time. There are investors who lead rounds and there are investors who don't. If you don't have a lead, then going and starting to talk to people who don't lead rounds and say, oh, come back when you have a lead is a waste in time. Put more time into pre-qualifying who you will pitch to and less time into pitching. Whenever possible, don't pitch. Set up a meeting saying, I'd like some guidance and advice on the pitch I'm doing. If the pitch is terrible, they'll give you a suggestion. You haven't lost anything, right? You've started to build a relationship. If the pitch is wonderful, say, oh, this is ready. And, they'll, and, and now you've gained something by being humble. If there's someone who thinks it's good, but it's outside of their field, they can potentially introduce introduce you. The sort of silly sounding rule of thumb is if you want money, ask for advice. And if you want advice, ask for money. And it is remarkably true. People feel flattered when you ask them when you ask them for advice. So go and when you find a potential investor through a contact, find an intermediary who can go and say, can you set up a meeting with them so I can get their advice? I'm not looking for money now, I'm looking for advice. In the ideal yeah. world, you keep looking for advice until you've soft circled three times as much money as you're ready to raise. But at the very least, get introductions to ask advice. If you're not already on Lunch Club, people are wonderful about Lunch Club, about making introductions and giving advice. Don't ask anyone for money there. Ask ask for advice, and uh, I've introduced a lot of my, of my companies to people that have ultimately funded them 
through what started as a casual conversation asking for advice on Lunch Club. Signal.nfx.com is doing pretty well at helping people figure out who to talk to if you're not on their platform yet. I recommend it. I'm not personally involved in running either of these organizations, but I'm seeing good results. Nice. So, yeah, some of those are really practical. Yeah, so Lunch Club, yeah, these uh, NFX uh, and definitely the advice, the outreach, as opposed to and soft circling three times what you want to raise. Yeah, so hopefully some of those tips um, are helpful on it. Um, I want to be cognizant of your time, Russell. Do you have time for another audience question or two, or uh, do you have to go? My my time my time it is yours for as long as you want me and people would like to uh, people would like to ask questions I'm putting in the chat my uh, bypass the waiting list get on to lunch club for anyone who would would like to to use it there you go awesome thanks so much for doing that yeah see the link that um Russell just put in there so yeah I'm sure that's super helpful to a lot of founders who uh, are are on the call. Uh, awesome. Yeah. So one question I want to ask you, this is from Elia. I don't actually know the full kind of context behind it, so I'll just read it. He says, is Y Combinator safe good enough for an investor and the startup, or do we need to have it checked by a lawyer? I assume this means like Y Combinator has released some uh, template version of their like safe note. And that's what he's asking is like, is it, is it founder friendly? Um, are you familiar with that at all? Or? So the Y Combinator safe, um, and there are two versions of it, the, the old version and the new version of it. The new version is the most commonly used safe in the world. At this point, if you're using anything which isn't the Y Combinator safe, the first question from, from most investors are going to be, why isn't this the Y Combinator safe? So use it un unchanged unless you've got a really, really strong reason to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's a very clear answer. So there you go. Yeah, that's good. You don't need to spend time or spend money on lawyers having them look over that uh, template. So very good. Uh, another question I think also from Elias is uh, he's asking about uh, what's the best way to find a good CTO that will work on sweat equity. I think this kind of goes back to what you were saying about you know having at least three team members who are mostly full time. I mean, if you are cash poor basically as a as a company. Uh, yeah, do you have um, tips for engaging with uh, bringing on co-founders through a sweat equity vested structure or something like that? Well, let's divide that into a couple of parts. Finding someone that will join your team for sweat equity is not the same as finding a co-founder. Often you want team members that will work for sweat equity rather than co-founders. Co-founders are you know, like marriages. It's a really big thing. Second, if you're going to have a co-founder, you know, you're thinking about a 10-year relationship. This is, do you have match values? The, the FI suggestion is that, the two, that you and your co-founders work on something together that none of you have ever done before, like setting up an event if you've never done it, just to see how it is that you work together. One of your big risks in a company is that co-founders will kill each other. I was involved in one company with really great biometric um, bi biometric technology, which would now be common, but 15 years ago was novel. And the founders could not stop from killing each other long enough to literally cash a $10 million customer check and the, co the company broke before we were, were able to accept the money. Um, there are co-founder matching events and one can look there there is no difference in statistical success between co-founding teams that are all one skill all technical all managing all whatever and ones that are mixed though the myths are otherwise hmm. depending That's upon good. i find that interesting yeah you said that at the beginning of your presentation too uh, but yeah i just uh, oh, i've heard oh. that Almost everything that people believe about predictors of success, other than looking at customers and other than experience, are myths. And so we can make two very different questions. What will predict whether you will succeed and what will predict whether you will get funded? And they're entirely different things. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you think you need, if you're looking for a CTO, 
the best thing you should do is start building a prototype with your own hands, whether that is no, whether that is no code or if it's software building prototypes with Ruby is really easy. If that's going to, if that's going as a physical object, make that a cardboard with glue. You'll be more attractive and taken more seriously by a potential co-founder if you started building it with your own hands. At the point you built it with your own hands, you can now go to things like meetups that are in that field, show off what you've done and say, I'm looking for a co-founder. And once you've got something to show with your own hands, you'll you'll get interest. And that that to my mind has worked better than the matching events. But going in there with just an idea and not something you built with your own hands, just too many people doing that who are clueless and uh, and so it does at that point you're better off just going to a matching event where they're used to dealing with people who haven't put the work in mm -hmm. yeah i think that makes a lot of sense particularly yeah with the early stage prototype i really think it really can't be early enough kind of like what you said uh physical cardboard and glue is better than um nothing nothing at all so uh yeah that, that makes a lot of sense um, I, I actually have another uh, kind of call that's speaking up on us and we're running a little bit over time. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Russell, for, for yeah, your time today. And uh, we're just going to go over kind of some quick details here uh, before we switch over to, to the networking portion. But yeah, that was super information dense presentation. And um, thanks so much for, for your time and, and putting, putting it together for us. Um, Part two here uh, that we're going to switch to in a minute is, uh, is uh, the Airmeet uh, Open Networking. Reminder, again, it's just like if you're on a desktop or laptop, you'll want to be in Firefox or Chrome. It doesn't work uh, in Safari very well. Uh, and if you're on a mobile device, you want to use the actual Airmeet uh, mobile app. Otherwise, you won't be able to like match with people or join the tables in the networking lounge. Um, another pro tip is uh, just yeah, if you do meet somebody you want to connect with here, uh, make sure to exchange uh, contact information or social uh, handles with them, uh, send them a direct message so they don't lose each other. That can sometimes happen in online networking. Uh, and yeah, just please be respectful of everybody's time, particularly when you're on the group networking tables. I would introduce or uh, be brief with your own introductions, take turns, uh, ask questions. Um, and and uh, in the final uh, slide here is to just, uh, yeah, make sure. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, have fun. Yeah, we're, we're excited that we're hosting these new events. They're just for uh, you, the FI Worldwide Network, and uh, yeah, we hope that you'll enjoy the time to connect with others uh, here. Uh, thank you to Russell, and thank you to everybody who uh, joined us here today, and yeah, we will see you out in the networking lounge shortly. Thanks so much, Russell. A pleasure.